Hello and welcome to the first actual video in this tutorial series. Today we'll be implementing one of the most fundamental parts of any game, a vector class. I imagine that this will be a video I direct viewers to in future tutorials, as it's probably the most common class required by games, and thus is extremely reusable. So, what is a vector? A vector is a mathematical quantity with both magnitude and direction. Vectors are commonly used to represent positions and directions in games. They can be added, subtracted, multiplied and divided by scalars and other vectors. For our purposes, we're only going to be using 2D vectors, which you can think of as just a way of storing x and y floating point values in a single variable. Using vectors should make our code a lot easier to write and understand. Not to mention there's also a handful of really useful methods that can be made for vectors. There's the dot product, which basically allows you to find the alignment of two vectors. The inverse cosine of this alignment factor will give you the angle between the vectors. The normalized function takes any non-zero vector and returns a unit vector in the direction of that vector. Uh, where a unit vector can just be thought of as uh, a vector with a length of 1. Then there's the length or magnitude function, which will allow for the Euclidean length of a vector to be calculated. This can be used to work out the distance between two points. So if you found the difference between two points and then got the length of that vector, you would have the length between the two points. Another useful one is the reflect function. This will reflect an incident vector by a given normal vector. This function is used to calculate like the change in velocity when a ball hits a surface, etc. Anyway, I'm not going to lecture you any further on how useful vectors are, just know that they're everywhere and it's for a reason. So let's jump right into the code then. So we'll create a new file and call it vector.py. In this file we can start to write our class. We'll create the constructor and define the members, like so. So class vector def underscore underscore init underscore underscore self x floats and y floats. And then we can assign our members self to x equals x and self to y equals y. And the naive of you watching might think, oh, well, we're done. We can hold values. And to an extent, it has the required functionality. You can set and access values. But it's going to be extremely tedious to do just about anything with these vectors. If you try to add, subtract, multiply, or divide these instances by anything, you're going to get a handful of errors. This is because the interpreter has no idea how it should handle an add operation for our new class type. To make code like this legal, we need to create constructor overloads for any operators that we want to override. And we do this like so. So def underscore underscore add underscore underscore. So these are like predefined functions you can overload. Uh, we're going to give uh, ourself and an another. And then we're going to check if the instance that we're receiving, other, is the same type as our class. And if it is, we know that we can access the uh, x and y values from other. And so we return, you know, how you add two vectors together. Both components added, return. And then if it's not, we're going to try and add other to each component separately. Okay, let's test this out. And there you go. You can see that these vectors are now added together using that code there. And we can replace vector b here with any other type that would be able to be multiplied by a float and it would work correctly. So we can do obviously another float. We can do an integer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure any other types that you can use, but you know, if they have an implicit way of being multiplied by a float, then they'll work. All right, now let's create some of these overloads for the subtract, multiply and divide. All right, there we go. Now we can do the same as we we're doing with adding, but with all the other operators as well. So these overloads will work fine whenever there's a vector object on the left side of the operator. But in a situation where we have a vector on the right and a non-vector on the left, it will break as we haven't defined a reverse operator overload. For vectors, I tend to only create a reverse multiply overload because that's the only one you can really end up using. Because the multiply operation can be reversed without changing the result, we can simply call the normal overload function from within the reverse multiply using the parameter that we received. Just be aware that if you want to overload an operator where the order matters, like subtract or divide, you would need to fully write the reverse function to work the other way around and not just call the regular subtract or divide overload. It might also be a good idea to create an operator overload for the equals operator so we can check if two vectors are the same. This is done by overriding the underscore underscore eq underscore underscore function. And here's the code for doing that. So we would check if it's the vector class, so self dot underscore underscore class. And then if it is, we check each component. So if self dot x equals other dot x, and if self dot y equals other dot y, return true, otherwise return false. And then if it's a scalar or unknown, we just check if each component is equal to that. And if so, return true, otherwise return false. And that's pretty much the basics, so that will all work now. But we're going to implement some, some of the useful functions that I talked about at the start now. So we'll start with the dot product, abbreviated to just dot in our case. This function will take two vectors, multiply their respective components, and add them together. 
So vector 1's x will get multiplied by vector 2's x, and then that gets added onto vector 1's y multiplied by vector 2's y. And the code for that is just here. If both input vectors are normalized, then the output will always be in the range from minus 1 to 1. It will be 1 when both the vectors are aligned or parallel, it will be 0 when they're perpendicular, and negative 1 when they're opposite. This output will also obviously linearly change in between, so if they're like uh, 45 degrees apart, then you'll get something like uh, 0.5. And the nice thing about the resultant value from this function is that it can be fed straight into an inverse cos function to get the angle between the vectors. And if you go and look at a cos graph, then you'll understand and it'll become apparent why this works. All right, uh, next we're gonna implement distance and length functions. So firstly, let's make functions for the squared length and squared distance, as it's often useful to get the squared distance between two points. It's also quicker than calculating the actual distance because you don't need to do a square root. Uh, the distance functions are essentially identical to the length functions, but take two positions uh, or two vectors as opposed to just the one. And here they are. So we have length squared, which is basically just multiplying or squaring the values and adding them together. Done. And then disk squared is basically doing the same thing, so you call length squared, but instead of using a, a vector on its own, you take the two vectors, find the difference, and pass it into the length squared function. This is very simple maths going on here, of course. So you've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared and we're just keeping it as squared at the moment. Okay, and then we can implement the actual versions of the length. So basically you just call length squared and then call square root on it. And the same for the distance, we just call length of the uh, difference. All right, next we'll implement the normalized function. So this will take a single vector. So the first thing we need to do is find the length of the initial vector. And then we're gonna divide each component by that length to create a unit vector. Uh, but we'll need to check if this length is zero because obviously we can't divide things by zero and if it is zero then we're just going to return some default value. Most of these vector operations tend to be very simple functions but they are very very useful. Okay then we'll create a reflect function. So this code I basically just grabbed from the GLSL website because that's where I kind of found it. It's used in shaders a lot for reflections of like light and you know general reflections and stuff. It, basically takes the instant vector and then reflects it using a normal vector. It's very, very simple, single line. So the way it does this is we take the instant and normal, do the dot product of them, multiply it by double the normal, and then return uh, the instant vector minus this calculated value. Okay, moving swiftly on to the negate function, which is just going to invert both values, so zero minus or minus uh, each component. Uh, yep, and then the right function, this is effectively finding the vector perpendicular to the given vector or just a rotation 90 degrees clockwise. And then you can create a left function also pretty easily by just calling right and then calling negate on that right vector. And then finally, just to finish off our class, we're going to do some random vector functions. So our first random function will be generating a random vector with each component being in the range uh, from negative 1 to 1. And then our second function will be getting a direction, and it'll just be using this initial function and normalizing it. And that's pretty much it. Oh, we'll probably also need a copy function, just to copy the contents of one vector and return a new vector, so we don't have any kind of referencing issues where you assign a vector to another vector, and instead of creating a new one, it just creates a reference to the old one, so when you edit the new one, it will be editing the values stored in the old one as well, which is not what you want. Okay, and then before we finish, I'd just like to add a few member functions to the vector class. So to make the integration with Pygame a little easier, uh, lots of functions like to take screen positions in the form of an int tuple. And so it's a good idea to kind of make a function to re return our vector contents in the form of an int tuple. And that's what we're doing here. We're just returning each component as an int. And then I just thought I'd throw in a effectively co a copy of the copy function called set. So as a member, you do vector.set and then you give another vector and it will copy the values. All right, and that's done. Should be done now. So. That's pretty much all you need for a basic vector class, got all the required and necessary functions. Um, I'll probably add to this file at some point in the future if we need to add any other vector operations, but the ones we've already implemented are pretty much the base ones and you shouldn't need any others, so I don't think I'll be modifying this file anytime soon. Yep, but feel free to add your own functions if you think you might need any. And uh, yep, so that's the first tutorial. Uh, next week we're going to be covering the game loop, so hopefully I'll see you then.